in just nine days in Houston. So I'm looking forward to that. Let's talk a little bit about how the types of diabetes are, are united. So there's a lot of different types of diabetes. Type 1.5, a lot of people are just learning about, also known as LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. And that's basically a slow onset version of type 1. Type 1 is what I'm living with. My insulin or my pancreas doesn't produce any insulin. I have diabetes antibodies that... Um, supposedly have destroyed beta cells. So it's classified as an autoimmune condition. And I have to inject insulin to eat food. And that's typically what happens with type 1.5 diabetes. Pre-diabetes, we have a lot of people living with pre-diabetes. A lot of people don't even know they have pre-diabetes. Type 2 is the most common, you know, over 90% of all people diagnosed with diabetes have type 2. Gestational diabetes happens during pregnancy. But the key thing for this presentation is that Insulin resistance can be present in all forms. So pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes, insulin resistance is the cause. Like it's a precursor. You cannot have any of those three conditions unless you have, have some advanced form of insulin resistance. Now, type 1, type 1.5, those are autoimmune conditions. You can have those conditions and be insulin resistant. We call that double diabetes. All right. And so... When we talk about becoming insulin sensitive and reversing insulin resistance, this is applicable to all forms of diabetes and quite frankly, a lot of people beyond diabetes. So uh, upwards of 45% of the population is insulin resistant. So the key thing here also is that insulin resistance can be thought of as a, as a central node to a laundry list of chronic diseases. This is just a few of them. So the number one cause of death for people living with all forms of diabetes is heart disease. Okay. If you're insulin resistant, you have an increased risk of developing everything you see on the screen, cancer, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, fatty liver disease. That's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, Alzheimer's disease, neuropathy, erectile dysfunction, blindness, retinopathy, PCOS, obesity, Insulin resistance, if you can become insulin sensitive, you are addressing all of these things simultaneously and, and really putting yourself in prevention mode. And in many of the cases, being able to reverse some of these conditions listed on the screen. So what is insulin resistance? Here's the actual dictionary definition. It is the diminished ability of cells to respond to the action of insulin in transporting glucose from the bloodstream into muscle and other tissues. So in short, what's happening is your body is struggling to do the process of moving glucose from your bloodstream into your cells. And so you end up with elevated blood glucose levels, right? And initially what's happening is in a lot of people who are insulin resistant that don't know it, those are the people who have healthy A1C numbers. If they checked their blood glucose, they would see that their blood glucose is fine but they're producing excess insulin to maintain those healthy blood glucose levels. And that's where something like a fasting insulin test can become really insightful. And you want to be working with, you know, qualified medical professionals to be able to interpret that information. But uh, a lot of people are living with insulin resistance that don't even know it. They don't have the signs yet. All right. So this information really does apply to the bulk of our population. So the primary cause of insulin resistance is the excess consumption of dietary fat. Fat blocks insulin from working properly. It blocks insulin from doing its function to signal those tissues to open up and accept glucose. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna cover the history of this topic. And this is where it gets fascinating. Like strap your seatbelts. <laughs> this is, it is, it is mind boggling that this information has not been shared and isn't easily understood by the population. And we can discuss some of that later on and some of the reasons of, of why I, I don't really know. But this, this is information that's been clearly documented and demonstrated since insulin was discovered, which is absolutely fascinating. So insulin was first discovered in 1921. And then in 1922 is when it was first injected into a human being, right? So Insulin, it's a hormone. It's a necessary required hormone. Everybody here, we all produce it. Or for me, I inject it. Um, but we didn't know what it was. We could know what was going on in that case until 1921. And then once they figured it out, okay, well, now they could treat people in 1922. 
And as early as 1926, Dr. Sansom saw that by feeding his patients bread, potatoes, low-fat milk, and fruit, he could improve their insulin sensitivity. So this is not a low-fat diet. We're going to go into detail about what a truly low-fat diet is. I showed you on in the initials that it's no more than 15% of calories from fat. We'll get into that. But this is it was a very early study uh, published in JAMA, one of the most prestigious journals. And he used, in his own words, he said it was a radical experiment. It was a radical experiment with 150 patients. And when he increased their carbohydrate intake significantly, insulin requirements remained the same. They didn't need more insulin, right? So this is an improvement in their ability to metabolize glucose, right? They became more insulin sensitive. And more importantly, is that, is, again, as early as 1926, we started to see that the bigger picture of what an improved level of insulin sensitivity means for somebody's overall health. So prior to the discovery of insulin, diabetes was essentially a death sentence. I mean, people were really, really struggling. They, they were just trying to keep it as low carb as possible to basically stay alive. And then once they could finally, you know, use insulin, they started to learn a lot. And these folks were turned to normal physical and mental activity. They didn't have a hard time managing their blood glucose levels. They improved their cardiovascular health. The diet was more palatable than you know, previous diets that they were trying to use to treat diabetes. They had reduced cravings for forbidden foods and the diet was cheaper. So they saw a number of benefits. In 1935, Dr. Rabinovich publishes a paper called The Effects of the High Carbohydrate Low Calorie Diet Upon Carbohydrate Tolerance in Diabetes. Now, he says low calorie in this title, but it actually was isocaloric. So he didn't, he didn't decrease calories, didn't increase them, he kept them constant, right? So it wasn't some like 600 calorie diet or some 800 calorie diet, which a lot of people are using. That's not what this was, all right? So he fed people a very consistent diet. He had a very solid mechanism for teaching people how much to eat and what to eat. And it was very systematic. So this is kind of an example, an, an overview of what they'd eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the key thing here is it was a significant increase in carbohydrate compared to the low carb diet, right? So bacon, fatty meats, and fish and cream were all forbidden. And in this case, he had 24% of calories coming from fat. Still not as low as we want it to be, still not as low as modern science has shown leads to greater insulin sensitivity, but some remarkable re results for the early days here. So on the old diet, this is after five years, the average insulin use in the low carb group, higher in fat, it only dropped by about 1%, okay? Saw a 1% reduction. Whereas on this new diet, 57% reduction in insulin use. Okay, that's a dramatic change in insulin sensitivity here. So he concluded this paper showing or uh, demonstrating that there's a lot of benefits here. Patients feel and look well. They have more energy, all right? They adhere to the diet better. This is applied to all forms of diabetes. They had a significant decrease in the incidence of diabetic coma. They improved their cardiovascular health. It simplified their diabetes management. And at the time, tuberculosis was the thing. So they had a low tuberculosis rate, which was great. And this quote, it really says it all. It really does. This is just in 1935, we, we've known this. And somehow this information has gotten lost. Suffice it to say, that now appears to be fairly well established that carbohydrates improve, whereas fats impair carbohydrate tolerance. And that carbohydrates increase, whereas fats decrease the sensitivity of the individual, animal, and man to insulin. All right? We saw this in 1935. Dr. Hemsworth was the man who was actually credited with discovering the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, these are legendary researchers here. And he published a paper in 1935, which was quite fascinating. This is a insulin depression curve. So they're actually not allowed to do this anymore. It's not really safe. This is some sort of old school science. But what you're seeing on the screen is one individual who was tested, there was a, a sort of a washout period. This was seven different diets that were consumed over several weeks, and there was a washout period, then they would do it again. This is a very thorough, very rigorous study here. And what you see is I'm actually, there's seven different diets. So I'm going to zoom in in a second here. But on the left, on the upper left corner, that's 80% of calories coming from fat. Then on the bottom right, 
13% of calories coming from fat. So we're sort of in that magical number of under 15%, right? So that's, that's a truly low fat diet there. And the difference is striking. And I'm actually going to go back. Let me explain this. I'm going to go back for, to the other slide for a second. So what you're seeing is an insulin depression curve. So the, in the way upper left, you see the arrow that says insulin three units at zero minutes. So it was injected at zero minutes. And then you're seeing the blood glucose level, 100, 80, or 90, 80, and 70, right? So you're seeing that insulin didn't start lowering this person's blood glucose level until about, uh, call it like six minutes or so, right? And then when the insulin did start working and started lowering the blood glucose level, it maybe went to about 85 or so, okay? That was on the high fat diet. Then on the far right, now you're looking at the low fat diet. Insulin started to work faster. The insulin maybe started working around two minutes, three minutes there. It started to lower the, the patient's blood glucose levels. And when it did start working, it drew the blood glucose below 70. So that larger shaded region is a reflection of insulin sensitivity. Insulin began working faster and it drove the blood glucose lower, okay? So if we go back and look at the, the overall um, picture here, as the diet becomes lower and lower in total you know, fat intake, right? So we're getting low fat, low fat, low, like more and more <laughs> reduced fat here, right? You see that shaded region is getting larger and larger. It's a stepwise increase in insulin sensitivity. And that's what was fascinating here. And he concluded this paper by saying, it is demonstrated that the efficiency with which a standard dose of crystalline insulin acts on the blood sugar is determined by the carbohydrate content of the diet. So that the greater the amount of carbohydrate in the diet, the greater the sensitivity of the organism to insulin, right? I mean, this is very clear. Um, it's the exact opposite of what we've been told today. 